What's up everyone, Chrissy Endell here for ChannelFireball.com and welcome to another edition of Audio Articles, where we bring you articles written by the top Magic the Gathering pros in audio form, so you can listen on the go, wherever and whenever you want, for free, Monday through Friday. We've also got a lot of really great content on YouTube, so head on over to YouTube, search for Channel Fireball, and ring the bell next to the subscribe button. And if you're trying to make it easier to listen to the podcast, ask Siri to play the most recent episode of Channel Fireball's podcast, and you're all set. We're also available on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Today's episode is written by Brian DeMars. Brian's going to talk about the mechanics that he thinks were the biggest mistakes ever. Thanks for being with us today, and here is The 8 Mechanics That Were the Biggest Mistakes in Magic History by Brian DeMars. Have you ever looked at the comprehensive list of magic keywords and mechanics? If you haven't, you might be surprised to learn that there are well over a hundred different unique abilities. In its decades of existence, magic has grown and expanded to occupy tons of design space in its journey to become the most dynamic and complex game ever created. Today I'm going to take a closer look at the most insane keywords or mechanics ever printed on a magic card and giving you my thoughts on the impact and legacy of these iconic designs. I'd also like to get people thinking about whether these are unsavory mechanics or if a few bad apples or broken cards spoiled the whole bunch. With so many mechanics to choose from, I was a little surprised at how easy it was to focus my list down to just a handful of candidates. I've got a list of eight, and I have two worthy honorable mentions. First up are honorable mentions. Miracle. Avison Restored brought us the miracle keyword. Basically, the idea here was to create uber-powerful spells that got significantly cheaper to cast if they were the first card drawn for the turn. On the one hand, there was a lucky top deck aspect to these cards. If you played standard during this period, you'll likely remember rolling your eyes when an opponent spiked a bonfire of the dam for 7 and the game ended. Obviously, Miracles has been a steadfast force and legacy for years and years now. While the mechanic does have a top deck feel, there's also a cool dynamic of manipulating the top of your library to set these cards up with cards like Jace the Mind Sculptor or Brainstorm. So is it a good or a bad mechanic? I'm going to go with this is a bad mechanic. From a gameplay perspective, I don't like the weird tension between having to look at the card that you're about to draw and revealing it before it goes to your hand. I don't like the weird tension between the card being in the Miracle Limbo, where it can be Vendillion clicked out of a player's hand before it's cast. In a general sense, everything about this mechanic feels weird and non-intuitive, which simply complicates an already ridiculously complicated game for the average player. I like Terminus as a legacy card and the way it pressures the format, but I could live without new miracles in the future. Second honorable mention is Banding. You guys remember the Banding decks that dominated the early years of Magic? Yeah, me neither. Banding is easily one of the most comically bad mechanics in the history of the game, and not because it's broken. Imagine that you created an amazing new game that you wanted people to learn to play. I don't know about you, but the first thing that I would make sure to do would be to make a mechanic that was super complicated, non-intuitive, and worked differently depending on whose turn it was. Also, I'd be sure to only put that ability on cards that are underpowered and teetering on the verge of 100% unplayable. I'd also be sure to make a rare that's a color-shifted bad common with the same stats, cost, and ability. So is this a good or a bad mechanic? Banding is the worst. I'm probably in the highest 1% of the players that understand how banding actually works, and I still have to go deep into the tank when somebody plays one of these annoying cards in Moto Limited Masters Draft. Ban the band. I'd love to see these cards never come back in any meaningful way ever again. Banding is unique in the sense that it kind of sucks, but I still feel compelled to hate on it just because it's so confusing and messy. And then there were eight. These are the eight mechanics that are huge game changers. Are they bad design or victims of circumstance? I'm going to give you my thoughts and rankings, but I'd love to discuss and riff on these mechanics with you in the comments. If you disagree, I'd love to know why. And if you think I nailed it or even got close, let me know. Here they are, the eight that you love to hate. Coming in at number eight, Affinity. To Affinity and Beyond! I'm a firm believer that the Affinity mechanic severely damaged the credibility of Magic during the Mirrodin block. The Artifact Beatdown deck was absurdly overpowered in a way that can only be described as comical, but does that mean that it's a bad mechanic? Quote unquote Affinity is a perennial tier 1 modern deck despite the fact that it curiously lacks the cards with the keyword Affinity. People also forget that there are cards with an affinity for other things than artifacts, like Spire Golem. Was Affinity a mistake? So what do you think? Good or bad mechanic? 
Mirrodin and Darksteel 100% went out the door with some glaring problems, but I don't think that the affinity mechanic was necessarily one of them. I'm going to express the off-beaten path opinion that affinity is actually a cool and balanced mechanic, and that the problem was 100% that the artifact lands were too good in concert with specifically affinity for artifacts. Not only did Artifact Lands essentially have the cost of affinity for Artifact Spells, but they also doubled and even tripled as sources of damage alongside Disciple of the Vault and Arcbound Ravager. I'd welcome the return of affinity, but rebranded. Affinity for lands, affinity for creatures, affinity for enchantments, explicitly anything other than affinity for artifacts in a set with Artifact Lands. Coming in at number 7, Energy. E equals metagame impaired. Kaladesh block brought us energy, and there was unfortunately no way to get rid of it aside from some strategic standard bans. The idea behind the mechanic was to create an alternate resource that could be traded to do various different things in the game. I'll give credit for the outside of the box thinking behind this mechanic, but at the end of the day, I think this was a failed experiment. So was this a good or a bad mechanic? Awful. Terrible. Possibly even cruel. Aside from giving points for trying something outside the box, I think this mechanic turned out to be just bad. It's also impressive to me that I think this mechanic was bad on several completely different levels and axes, which I think is almost challenging to do. First, it's tedious. It's another arbitrary thing to be constantly tracking over the course of a game. Magic is complicated enough without needing to track another resource. Secondly, it was oppressively powerful. The cost of generating advantage via the cultivation of energy was undercosted and versatile. Third, the energy shell was portable and could be abused with other powerful combos, primarily Copycat and Etherworks Eldrazi. Even once those combos were banned, the energy shell was still oppressive. The positive spin is that none of these cards are likely good enough to exist outside of standard, which means that I'll never have to be pestered about the proper or improper ways of tracking my energy by a judge ever again. Why can't I track it on the energy counter I got in my booster pack with a die so that my opponent and I can both see it and agree on it? Oh, because it's more awkward for us to both track it separately on our score pads? That makes sense. Not. For all these reasons, I hope energy dies with Kaladesh. Number six, Hexproof. Hexproof me wrong. Hating on Hexproof is a popular opinion that I 100% understand. Oh, I can't interact with your card. Oh, and now you're putting auras on it. Oh, and now I'm dead because Hexproof is obnoxious. Back in the day, we had Shroud and we were happy to have it on cards like Nimble Mongoose. Compared to the power of Hexproof, the Mongoose is now loose. Permanents, particularly creatures that are immune to 99% of removal, are clearly very powerful, especially in situations where those creatures can be further enhanced by auras or equipment. Shroud was already very good. Did it really need to be made even better? So is this a good or a bad mechanic? Ultimately, Hexproof is a good mechanic to exist, but in moderation. Magic needs foils to powerful strategies, and let's face it, decks that kill everything have typically been very strong. Personally, when it comes to Hexproof, I prefer a less is more approach. I think it detracts from the game to have ridiculous giant dragons that can't be targeted appear with a high level of frequency. I'd even like to see a more balanced split between Hexproof and the slightly less powerful Shroud. Hexproof is a necessary evil. Number five, Delve. Cruising towards the most broken mechanics of all time. Delve certainly got some cards banned. Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time were clearly ridiculous magic cards in eternal and modern formats. Tournament magic is largely about finding ways to break parity between two powerful and synergistic strategies. The ability to transform something that doesn't have intrinsic value, i.e. cards in graveyard, life total, or cards in your library, into tangible, usable resource is extremely powerful. The delve spells start expensive, but if you can delve for maximum value, or even close to it, players can get extremely powerful effects for a modest investment of actual mana. So is this a good or a bad mechanic? I think this is a great mechanic. I love, 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 love delve, but it's always going to teeter on the edge of broken. Dig and Cruise were science experiments that created a monster. In a Xerox shell that's already designed to churn through cards, the ability to generate huge card advantage for little mana is extremely efficient, since those decks are putting lots of cards in the graveyard already. Fetchlands also present a big problem with Delve in any format where they coincide, since these are free cards going to the graveyard to supplement mana cost. 
Delve is an elegant and intuitive mechanic, which is something I enjoy and would love to see return in future sets with the stipulation that future Delve cards take to heart the lessons we learned about how Delve works in Eternal and Modern. It almost feels impossible to design Delve cards that could be competitive and standard and not be completely broken outside of that format. I'd love to see more Delve cards with the understanding that it can't really be pushed for standard because doing so makes it too broken in other formats. Alright, we made it to the top half of the list. These were tough to order because I know everybody has strong opinions about which cards and decks they love to hate the most. I did my best to make the list as legit as I could. Number 4, Cascade. Spin the wheel! Alar Reborn is one of the most forgettable magic sets with a legacy of one of the most obnoxious mechanics ever designed. All the cards were multicolored and all of them were terrible except the ones that had the Cascade ability, and those ones were all broken in half. I know I'm throwing the hate on Cascade, but I'm going to go even further. I don't just think the Cascade was a bad concept, I also think it was executed poorly. Bloodbred Elf was simply too powerful. Its card advantage, raw power, and difficult to answer without falling behind. The rest of the cards with the mechanic were uninteresting, uninspired, and primarily functioned as enablers to cheat cast time spiral suspend cards. So was it a good or a bad mechanic? I'm going to go with bad on Cascade. I wouldn't bat an eye if there was never a new Cascade spell ever again. With that being said, if Cascade were to return, I'd prefer to see it on more expensively costed cards as more of a limited base mechanic. If Bloodbraid Elf and 3 mana tutors for Hypergenesis and Living End didn't exist and Cascade was scaled towards the top, perhaps I would have a different opinion. Magic needs heroes and villains, and Cascade is one of those keywords that I love to hate because it's so pushed past the brink of sanity. Number 3, Dredge. Bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. Dredge is an outrageous mechanic that made its first appearance as the Golgari themed keyword from the original Ravnica set. I don't think anybody could have seen the consequences that Stinky and the Troll would have on the future of tournament magic. Graveyard decks have always been a thing, but the Dredge engine took that concept to a new level by fostering decks that simply played cards for free from the discard pile. In a Dredge deck, the graveyard is like a makeshift hand that generates tons of raw resources and plays. I was shocked when I first saw this deck in action all those years ago and it certainly changed the way magic was played. So what do you think? Good or a bad mechanic? It's hard to throw too much hate at the existence of these cards. I don't think they came into existence with any inkling of what the archetype would eventually become. With that being said, while Dredge can feel obnoxious to play against, it is on a comparable power level to the other decks legal in Eternal formats and adds a completely unique dynamic. Now that we've gotten to a point where the answers have caught up to the raw power Dredge presents, I actually enjoy Dredge's existence in magic. It's another scary deck that forces people to stay honest about how they build and tune their decks. I would even say that I wouldn't be against seeing more cards with dredge printed in the future, with the stipulation that they're carefully designed and that they don't dredge for more than 2-4 to four cards. Sure, dredge is broken, but is it really more broken than the other stuff that people do in Eternal or Modern? It was a surprise pillar, and it appears to have worked itself out over time. In the here and now, I'm glad that dredge exists. Number 2, Storm. Tendrils of Agony wants to join the X-Men. Sorry Storm, but we're renaming you Drizzle. Tendrils of Agony is clearly a mutant. It didn't take too long after these cards were revealed in Scourge for people to realize that they were absurdly broken. Mind's Desire was restricted in Vintage before it was ever eligible for tournament play. I don't ever remember that happening before or since. Storm is a mechanic that was likely underestimated while being designed. It'll be a challenge for people to cast 9 spells and tendrils in a turn, right? It's also funny that the mechanic was brought back during the Time Spower block with some Tame Down variants. It turns out that the Tame Down Storm cards are still completely insane. The problem with Storm lies in the fact that it's a perfect win condition for decks that want to draw cards and make mana, literally the two most broken things in the game. The drawback of churning through cards and drawing your deck is that you're not interacting with the board, a void that is completely offset by the Storm win conditions like Tendrils or Grape Shot. So, good or bad? I love playing Storm, and so I'm glad that it exists, but I cannot in good conscience say that it was a well thought out or good idea. It's a terrible mechanic that exists to facilitate decks designed to play solitaire. There's no reason to ever make more Storm cards, but the damage is already done. Eternal and modern win cons already exist and Storm will prevail. And last but not least, coming in at number one, Phyrexian Man. Just as a reminder, Birthing Pod, Mental Misstep, Dismember, Probe, Apostle's Blessing, Gutshot, Noxious Revival, and Vault Scourge 
just to name a few. I hope that just hearing this list of cards is enough to convince you why Phyrexian Mana is the worst mechanic of all time. It's a sprawling list of obnoxious free and banned cards. One of the fundamental building blocks of magic is that players need to produce mana to pay for the cost of their spells. While I can appreciate experimenting with various ways to supplement mana costs, simply paying life, especially for colored mana requirements, simply breaks too many rules of magic. I know, I know, there's plenty of decks that cheat mana costs in various ways, notably Dredge, but remember that those decks need to jump through a lot of hoops in order to do it. Whereas Phyrexian Mana simply offers spells and effects to a wide array of decks that wouldn't typically be able to pay for that effect with actual mana. Mental Misstep and Dismember are good examples. Zoo decks that counter your removal without paying mana? Colorless decks that can play Dismember? I've gone on record saying that I'd like more diversity in the terms of what abilities each color has access to, but here's an example of what happens when cards simply go way too far and take color commitment completely out of discussion. You get bad magic cards. So, good or bad? The worst. The worst. Like, the actual worst. I hope Phyrexian Mana is never revisited ever again, unless it's in regard to eternal-only printings in Commander, and even then, I'd vote against it. The one place that Phyrexian Mana belongs is in the next unset, because the mechanic was just a complete joke. This is a lot of fun to think about and write, and I hope that you enjoyed listening through my list and the observations I've made about some of the all-time most frightening keywords and mechanics ever to terrorize the Magic the Gathering tournament circuit. It was enlightening to break these concepts down and think about what made them work or not work given the context. It was interesting to me to look at a mechanic like Affinity and realize perhaps Affinity is actually a good mechanic, just not with artifact lands in the same set. Or, as it turns out, maybe Dredge existing has turned out to be a net positive for the game. It's also interesting how one or two cards with a keyword strongly impact how we collectively feel and receive that mechanic in terms of tournament play. Miracles, for instance, is synonymous with Terminus these days. So what do you think? Did I overlook any mechanics that deserve to be on the list? Do you have any pet peeve keywords that you'd like to give a shout out for? Do you want to go a different way on good or bad on any of these selections? I put them up in an order that makes sense to me based on my experiences, but I'd love to discuss these crazy, game-changing mechanics. That does it for this episode of Audio Articles. Make sure to head over to ChannelFireball.com and leave Brian a comment about what you thought about today's article. Or you can hit him up on Twitter, at BrianDemars1. Also make sure to check out CFBEvents.com. You'll find all the information about the upcoming GPs there. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks for being with us today, and I hope to see you soon. And until then, peace.